good to be with you on this Lord's Day. It's going to be a wonderful day. We've got a lot to get into, so let's do it. If you have a Bible, Genesis chapter 2, actually, we'll start off in Genesis chapter 2. We'll be in verse 8. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. If it's your first time here, welcome. My name is Scotty James, one of the pastors here. Very excited to partake in the Word of God with you this morning. It's going to be good. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 8, we'll start off by looking at verses 8 to 15. While you flipped there, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Matt, before he gave the sermon, he started out by asking the question, okay, now what? And it really resonated with me because I think it hits a nerve that all of humanity must wrestle with. We have these, these landmarks, these events in life that we look forward to, but the question still remains, even when you hit those landmarks. So a child is born. Wonderful. Okay, now what? Well, now they're supposed to learn how to walk and learn how to talk and do all that stuff. Wonderful. So now they turn five and they have all those basics down. Okay, now what? Well, now I guess you got to go to school. So you spend the next 12 years of your life learning and going to school and doing extracurricular activities and playing sports and all that kind of stuff. Wonderful. You graduate high school. Honors. Cool. Well, now what? Well, I guess now you got to go to college. So you go to college, get your degree. Okay, now what? Well, now I guess you got to get a job. So you get a job, you make money. Okay, now what? Well, now I guess you have a kid and get married. Opposite, uh, <laughs> opposite order. So you get married, you have that child. Beautiful. Okay, well, now what? Well, now you... You raise them and help them learn the things that you learned and give them the opportunities maybe that you never had. And they graduate high school and they move out and you're empty nester. Okay, well now what? Well now, you reach the pinnacle of life. You reach retirement. Retirement, the day in which you have no more bosses. You no longer have to... <laughs> yeah. You don't have to work for an income. You can spend your life doing whatever you want to do. Retirement, the, the Pinnacle, the goal of every American. But let me let you in on a little secret. Okay? Now what? The, the, the question still remains. I know many retired people who are financially set for the rest of their life, who can do whatever they want with their time, yet they still have this unsettledness because you haven't escaped the question. Okay, now what? And really, at the core of this question is a deeper question. What are we as humans supposed to do with our time? I was wrestling about this and, and praying about this recently, because retirement is not bad. Retirement is not the issue. Time is the issue. What are we supposed to do on this earth with the time that God has given us? What does it look like to live well? I think a lot of us... Our mentality in the culture is to live comfortably. Fine. Living comfortably and living well are two different things. You can have all the money in the world and still not live well. I want to live well. So what does it look like to live well? I was asking God to give me clarity in this, and I believe he did. When you go back to Genesis, specifically in the first two chapters, what we'll see are some principles tucked in there that if understood and properly applied are a recipe for what it looks like to live well in our humanity. Whether you're a preschooler, whether you're a middle schooler, elementary, high school, college, young adult, senior, these ingredients must be necessary in every stage of life if you are to live well. So let's look at it today. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the garden, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and from there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first was Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon, it winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man 
and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So the Bible opens up, or Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, has this picture of the garden. And you get the, the beauty of it and the serenity of it. There's, there's gold in it and there's rivers flowing through it. And God placed Adam in that garden, the Bible says, to work it and take care of it. So that was Adam's purpose. That was his, his employment, his job. He was supposed to work the garden and take care of it. But I find it very interesting the way that was phrased. Work it and care for it. At first, it, it sounds like the same thing, but it actually isn't. Those are two different words with two distinct meanings. They're similar, but they're different. And rather than this being just a, a coincidence, I believe it touches on part of the reason why God created humanity. It sheds some light on what we're supposed to do with our time. So let's unpack it. In your notes in verse 15, I want to encourage you to circle, take care of. Oh, excuse me, circle, work it, the first word. Circle, work it. That word, work it, in the Hebrew, it's this idea of serving or laboring in something. Other translations, instead of saying work it, use the word cultivate it. I prefer that. Adam wasn't supposed to just work in the garden aimlessly. He was supposed to cultivate it. To cultivate something is to develop it. It's to create. It's to draw out the potential that's in something. So picture a potter with a piece of clay. You have this ball of clay that has nothing to it, but that potter takes it and works it and adds water to it and presses into it and develops it and cultivates it and develops something greater than what it already was. It draws out the potential within that clay. And that's what Adam was supposed to do in that garden. He was supposed to take that garden, develop it, cultivate it, and make something beautiful with what God had entrusted to him. And this, this command to cultivate was consistent with his, his identity as an image bearer of God. Because when you look throughout the book of Genesis, specifically those first two chapters, what you see is that the God of Scripture is a God who cultivates things. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, so the Bible opens up with God creating the heavens and the earth. In the earth, it has, it has a description of the earth. It says the earth was formless and dark and empty. And so this can mean a lot of things. This might have spiritual undertones to it. But in its most basic sense, this planet is empty, it has no form, it's out of order. And then God takes this earth, this formless, lifeless, out of order earth, and he brings, begins to bring form to it. He begins to bring life to it. He begins to bring order to it. He cultivates it. As we look throughout the rest of chapter 1, I want you to, to see this picture of God cultivating. Look at verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 6, and God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. Verse 9, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so. Verse 11, then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be lights in the vaults of the sky to give light on the earth and it was so. Verse 20, and God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the vaults of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kinds and God saw that it was good. Verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals according to his kind, and it is so. Do you see what's happening here? God's cultivating. This lifeless earth now has life in it. This formless earth now has form to it. God is cultivating. And then he takes Adam and tells Adam, I want you to cultivate this garden. Why? Because I cultivate. Adam was to cultivate because as one who was supposed to reflect God, well, he had to cultivate as well. So what does it have to do with you and me? 
Okay, here's the first one to write down. You talk about living well. You were created to cultivate. Write that down. You, me, we were put on this earth to cultivate. To cultivate. No matter what age you are, no matter what season of life you are in, no matter what gender you are, you are to take the resources and relationships God has entrusted to you, and you are to cultivate them. A life well lived, a life that is functioning the way God intended it to function, is a life that takes the time God has given you and cultivates the garden in which God has placed you. Consider this, babies. A healthy baby is a baby who is cultivating their life. A baby learns to walk, learns to talk, learns to eat solid food, learns to use their motor skills. That's all cultivation of their body. And then when you go to elementary school, academics is meant to cultivate the mind. All seasons of life, preschool down to retired, we were made to develop, to build, to create, to draw out the potential within the things and the resources that God has placed in our life. And I give you a few aspects of life. I want to encourage you that you need to be devoting time to cultivating if you are to live well. It won't be on the screen, but it is a few for you right now. Cultivate your relationship with God. Okay? A life well lived is a life that cultivates their relationship with God. Listen, God does not desire a stale, stagnant, plateaued relationship with you. God desires that you would be growing in your knowledge of him, growing in your love for him, growing in your intimacy and nearness to him. Well, how does that happen? It doesn't happen by just sitting back. You've got to put forth effort, put forth energy, put forth focus by his grace into cultivating that sort of relationship. Second thing, cultivate a relationship with God's people. Cultivate a relationship with God's people. Cultivate a relationship with God's church. Shallow relationships happen. Acquaintances happen. Deep relationships must be cultivated. There must be effort put forth. There must be energy invested. Third one, cultivate, a relation, uh, cultivate the gifts or the graces that God has put within you. Cultivate the gifts and graces that God has put within you. All of us have gifts. The Bible calls them spiritual gifts. If you look at that word, it's actually grace. The Bible uh, says that all of us, if you're a believer, have measures of grace, measures of spiritual ability in which God has placed in you. And your job is to identify that measure of grace and to cultivate it and develop it so that others are blessed around you. Gifts don't bless people. Good gifts bless people. It's a difference. Teachers don't help people. Good teachers help people. Bad teachers actually hurt people. Surgeons don't help people. Good surgeons, developed surgeons help people. Bad surgeons hurt people. And so God has given all of us a measure of grace, a measure of gifting within all of us. And our job is to not just exercise it. You've got to take it. You've got to cultivate it. You've got to work it out and make it suitable so that it might edify those around you. Cultivate the gifts God has given you. Uh, another one, and then we'll move on. Cultivate the gifts God has placed around you. Okay, God has put gifts in you, and God has put gifts outside of you. He's blessed you with certain things. You've got to cultivate those things. If you have a business, your job is to cultivate that business. If you have a home, you've got a yard, you've got to cultivate that, that, that resource that God has entrusted to you. So a life well lived is a life devoted to cultivating the resources and the relationships that God has placed within your life. Go back to Chapter 2, verse 15. I'm going to start moving a little faster here. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and what? Take care of it. Circle that in your notes. Take care of it. Adam was placed in the garden not just to cultivate it, but to take care of it. That word care, it means to keep. It means to look after, to preserve, to watch over. It's the idea of maintaining, upholding, and giving proper attention to something. And so God wasn't supposed, uh, Adam was supposed to just cultivate the garden and leave. He's supposed to cultivate it and then watch over it, provide proper care for that garden. Okay, what does that have to do with you? Second one to write down. You were created to care. Not just cultivate, you were created to care as well. This is God placed Adam in the garden to cultivate it and care for it. God has placed you in a garden 
to cultivate it and care for it as well, to express ongoing love, ongoing attention, ongoing maintenance to the garden that God has entrusted to you, to the relationships and resources that God has entrusted to you. Everything that's alive needs care, everything. Everything that's alive needs care, and when you don't care for it, it will decay. So your relationships, you need ongoing care for your relationships. Your spouse, your children, your friends, your family, if those relationships don't have ongoing care, they will wither, they will die, they will diminish. You have to provide ongoing care for your relationships. For the resources God has blessed you with, the yard, the kitchen, you gotta clean your kitchen. You have to clean your room. You gotta clean your, your house, your car. Why? Because everything God has entrusted to you deserves and needs ongoing love, ongoing attention, ongoing care. And part of living well means caring for the resources and relationships that God has entrusted to you. Cool. What about you, though? What about me? What about, what about me? How much time and focus should I put on caring for myself? It's a question I've wrestled with for years. How are we as Christians supposed to approach the idea of self-care? It's two waves of thought, typically. I'm going to exaggerate, but it's typically what it is. There's one segment of the world that says that a good portion, maybe even the majority of your time, should be spent focusing on yourself. Self-care, self-love should be a primary focus for you. This tends to be the secular world. And the thought is that if you don't love yourself, if, you don't, if I don't love me, how can I love you? So I'm supposed to eat uh, uh, organic, non-GMO foods, and I'm supposed to I'm supposed to sleep in the best of the best temperature-regulated hydrofoam beds. And I'm supposed to use or wear shoes that have custom-fitted soles perfectly designed for my feet. And I'm supposed to execute a skincare routine of 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the afternoon and 45 minutes in the evening and sleep with a mask specifically designed for the pH levels of my skin. And I'm supposed to wake up every day and, and put an hour and a half into my appearance and wear makeup with, with earth-friendly ingredients. In fact, so earth-friendly that it makes me look no different from when I have it or don't have it. <laughs> and I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to spend quiet time every day for myself to focus on my personal happiness. That's one side of the, of the equation. Self-care, self-love, that's where it's at. Secular tends to be. Then you got the other side, and this, this isn't all Christianity, but this, is, this tends to be more in the, in the Christian community where I'm not supposed to care for myself. I'm supposed to die to myself. I'm supposed to deny every desire I have. I'm supposed to deny every compliment that comes my way. I'm supposed to deny every gift that's offered to me because I am a piece of scum that must be put to death. Self-care is not about life. Life is about self-denial, dying to yourself. After all, Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if you would come after me, you must take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. So life ain't about self-care. It's about self-denial. Now, I'm exaggerating, but not that much. There's varying degrees on each side of the spectrum, but that tends to be the argument. Extreme self-care, extreme self-denial. So which is the right one? Well, both and neither. Both and neither. Let's, let's, let's look at it for a moment. Okay, write down Mark chapter 6, verse 6. Mark 6, 6. Matthew, Mark, second book of the New Testament. Mark 6, 6, it reads, Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for your journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money nor in your belt. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. 
They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Okay, so the disciples, Jesus calls the disciples to him, and he gives them authority, spiritual authority, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and he sends them out two by two to go and, and execute this ministry. Okay, that's what happens. And then look at the report they give in verse 30. It says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Okay, so the most intense season of ministry they had ever experienced up to this point in their life. They're casting out demons. They're healing the sick. They're so busy they have no time to eat or to rest. And they report all this back to Jesus. And Jesus says, cool, let's go to a solitary place Let's get some food. Interesting. Jesus is telling them to focus on themselves. So is Jesus promoting selfishness and self-centeredness? Think about it. There's still more people that need deliverance. There's still more people that need to be healed. They're dying. And Jesus tells them to focus on themselves. So what is all this about? I believe Jesus understands that they're human and they have limitation, and that they will be better fit to serve God if they make sure that they are well themselves. Listen, your best work will come when you are at your best. Your best ministry will come when you are at your best. There is nothing holy, hear me, there's nothing holy about being worn out. There just isn't. There's nothing holy about being depleted and burned out. If you are to care for the work God has entrusted to you, you must also care for yourself. Yes, there are seasons in which you may fast, seasons in which you may deny your flesh or deny your bodily desires or your bodily needs so that you might devote yourself towards spiritual matters, but it's unhealthy to live in those spaces. That's not how God created you to be. And this is where the, the overly focused on self-denial piece misses the mark is that it denies the reality of your humanity and the beauty of your humanity. It denies the reality and the beauty of your humanity. To be human is to be limited. To be human is to have needs. You have to eat. You have to drink. You have to sleep. You have those needs. So the idea that I'm never going to take care of myself, I'm just going to focus on doing work, it denies the reality of your humanity. Listen, moms, let me give you a gentle word, at least consider it. Moms who feel like you have to do everything for your kid. Mom who feel like you who feel guilty if you don't give your kid everything they want, or if your kid asks and you say no, or if you need time for yourself. Listen, you are human, you are limited, and that is okay. Receive that. Men who feel like you can never take a break, who feel like you must work because you're a man and God made you to work. Listen, men, you are not Superman. You are not Superman. You are limited, and that is okay. God made you with limitations. Rest in that. Those limitations aren't just okay, they're actually good. Consider this. When God made Adam and Eve, back in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, he said it was good. He made them with limitations, and he called that state of being limited good. Your limitations are not just okay, they're actually good. Rest in that. So, if we're supposed to care for ourselves, then what's all this stuff about self-denial, and what are we supposed to do with that? Here's a few scriptures just to write down, because these scriptures talk about denying self. Write down Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 24. You can write down Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. You can write down Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 2, verses 6 to 7, verses 11 to 14. All of those verses talking about dying to yourself. So what's the balance? Here's the balance. You're not made to deny your human limitations. You're made to deny your sinful nature. There is a difference. We're to deny our fleshly appetites. We're to deny our sinful carnal, self-centered inclinations and appetites that all of us have. God does not want to end you. He wants to end the sin that is in you. There's a difference. The difference. God doesn't want to kill you. 
He wants to kill your flesh. He wants to kill the sinful nature that's within you. And that's where the perspective on self-care that the world holds to misses the mark. And that self-care never goes beyond the self. That's the problem. Non-GMO foods, organic foods for myself. Perfect custom-fitted shoes for myself. Beautifying appearance for myself. Focusing on myself for myself. Myself and my personal happiness is the aim of my life and the idol and the God of my life. And that's the problem with the secular mindset towards self-care. It never goes beyond you. But biblical self-care is a little different. God wants you to care for yourself, that you might be an instrument to express love to him and love to neighbor. Self-care goes beyond you. It's more than you. Self-care blesses God, and self-care blesses neighbor. So God wants you to take care of yourself so that you can effectively express love to him and love to neighbor. That's what self-care really is supposed to be all about. All right, so at this point, it's fair to say that living well means working well. Cultivating and caring, that's the work of humanity. Whether you are getting paid or not paid, retired or a preschooler, your life should be filled with cultivation and care for the garden that God has placed you within. Cool. But there's more to the story that has to be considered as well if you're talking about living well. Life's not all about work. There's, there's more to consider. And as we go back to the garden, I read through chapter one again very briefly. I want you to listen for a rhythm or a pattern that seems to be jumping out from the pages of scripture. Go to Genesis 1 verse 3. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. Listen for the pattern. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Sorry, wrong spot. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. The darkness he called night, and there was evening. There was morning the first day. Verse 6, and God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. Verse 8. God called the vault sky. There was evening. There was morning the second day. Verse 9, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. Verse 13, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. As you read through the rest of the chapter, you'll see the same pattern, the same rhythm. God does something. The day ends. Then he does it again. God does something. There's evening. There's morning. Day's over. He does it again. So this rhythm of God works, God stops working, the day is over, then he works again. And rather than this being just an uh, arbitrary thing, I think God is laying out a rhythm for life for us. God didn't have to create the day, earth in six days, just so you know. He could have snapped his finger and the earth was created. And so why did God span it out over six days and then show us this rhythm as well, I believe it's because it's a, it, it, it's a picture of what it means to live well. Work isn't supposed to be just continual. The picture that God gives, the Bible gives, isn't six straight days of work. It's work, rest, work, rest, work, rest. And at the end of the week, there's an extended day meant for a full day of rest. So here's the, the third piece of living well. You were created to rest. You were created to rest. Cultivate, care, that's your work, but you were also created to rest. To live well is to experience healthy rhythms of work and rest. And if you get either wrong, you will not live well. So those who don't work well will not live well. But those who don't rest well will not live well either. Both will die. You'll be living, but you'll be dead. If you don't work well, you will die of poverty. You will die of not having enough. You will die, even if you have tons of money, you will die of poverty. Your soul will be hungry for more. There are some who have tons of money, who don't care and cultivate, who are constantly looking for more, buying things they don't need, looking for more experiences. You're dead while you're living. You're not satisfied. You're looking for something to fill yourself with. You're not living well. You're hungry, yet you're well-fed. What is that? 
You're not doing what you were created to do. But on the other end of the spectrum, those who don't rest well will be dead while they're alive as well. Anxiousness, to, be, to live in anxiousness is to be dead while alive, in my opinion. I hate anxiety. I hate stress. Because I might as well be dead. That's what I feel like. When you are like this all the time or I'm like this all the time, that, that's not living. That just isn't. But when you don't know how to rest, that will be your life. And listen, I'm not being self-righteous because I fall into this boat and I'm making a generalization. So don't be offended. We don't know how to rest. Can we agree to that? As a culture, we do not know how to rest. We are untrained in rest, unaware of rest, unfamiliar with rest. And it should be no surprise that we don't always live well. When you have your conversations with your church friends after church or this morning, you say, how are you doing? I guarantee, what do they say? So tired. Or I'm so busy. Single people with no kids, I'm so tired. <laughs> Married people. <laughs> I'm, anyway, I, I, I'll tell you a quick story. I had this guy. I don't think he'll ever watch this. I, I had this guy. He was married. He had one kid. And so he asked me for prayer. Did I tell you guys about this? Yeah. He asked me for prayer. He said, what did you need prayer for? He said, my wife and I are so worn out. I said, okay, tell me what's going on. He said, our son, our nanny is sick. <laughs> and we've had to, you know, work with our son uh, for the past few days. Can you pray for me for strength? I told him, sounds hard sounds hard. I got six kids, no nanny. And you're complaining about one kid with a nanny? I'm not praying for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not praying for that. I digress. I digress. What was I talking? I lost my spot now. I'm all we, don't, we don't know how to rest. We don't know how to rest. Everybody's so tired. Everybody's so busy. We substitute rest for caffeine. Amen. We substitute rest for caffeine. God didn't make us to go, 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 go. We have to learn how to rest. Now, before we close, we can live our life, uh, spend our time cultivating, caring, resting. There's one more way you can spend your time, and that's wasting. Wasting is another way that you can spend your time. To waste is to squander, is to throw something away, is to spend something in a pointless, useless, aimless fashion. To waste the time that God has given you is to use your time in a pointless, aimless, purposeless way. When you waste something, you get nothing back in return. A waste of time is when you use your time and get nothing back in return. You may say, what about resting? If I sit and, and look at a sunset, isn't that waste? No. Resting isn't a waste. Rest, resting gets you something in return. It replenishes you. The purpose of rest is to many things. We actually, I want to have a series on rest soon. But one of the most basic things that rest does is it replenishes it renews your humanity. It renews your soul, renews your mind, renews your strength, renews your love. There's a good return on rest. But many of the things that we call rest are really just waste. If you have an activity that you call rest, but it doesn't renew your mind, renew your humanity, renew your soul, renew your love, renew your energy, but instead depletes your mind, depletes your energy, depletes your humanity, that is waste. Hear me on that. I'm not being judgmental. I'm just keeping it real with you. That is, that is waste. If you do something and afterwards your mind is uneasy and you're more anxious and you're more wanting, that is not rest. It's just not. It's a waste of time. That's what that is. And if we live our lives filled with waste, we will not live well because God did not create humans to waste. I believe he didn't. I really believe he didn't. God gave us enough time to do everything he wants us to do. I believe that. I heard that years ago. I've stuck to that. 
You have enough time to do everything God wants you to do. You have enough money to do everything God wants you to do. You have enough energy to do everything God wants you to do, but you don't have enough to waste. Actually, some of us do have enough to waste. I don't have enough to waste. I don't have enough money to waste. I don't. I don't have enough energy to waste. I don't have enough time to waste. And so if you're feeling like, oh, there's not enough time, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough energy, I mean, maybe something's off, right? You might need to get help. And I'm, so I'm talking about the, the 80, 80% of the population that where all those things are, are, are stable. You might be wasting time. You might be wasting money. You might be wasting energy doing things you don't really need to be doing. It's not what God made us to do. So as we wrap up this time, as we close, here's a question to really chew on this week. Okay, don't just dismiss this. I, I, would, I would wrestle with this in your quiet time. God, am I living well? Am I living well? Am I working well? Is time devoted to cultivation in my life? Am I cultivating a relationship with God, a relationship with people, cultivating the resources God has given to me? Is time devoted to caring? Am I caring for the garden in which God has placed me in? Caring for those relationships, caring for the, the possessions that God has blessed me with, caring for those resources. It's time to order to rest. Do I even know how to rest? Do I know how to cease from work and replenish my humanity? Or am I living a life of waste? Am I wasting money? Am I wasting time? Am I wasting energy? Am I depleting myself when I'm supposed to be re-energizing myself, really reflect upon these things and ask God to give you clarity in these matters. I was, this past week, I was, uh, I never get on, I rarely get on YouTube for no reason. But I was like, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to be young. I'm just going to get on YouTube. <laughs> so I got on YouTube for about 25 minutes. And afterwards, I was just, you know, scrolling, just looking for whatever. I felt so stupid afterwards. I'm being serious. That was probably the stupidest thing I've done all year. Afterwards, I felt, I felt anxious. I felt uh, wanting. I felt confused. I felt kind of dirty. Just something, something like, what, what am I doing? What a waste of time. Now, I'm not saying that you can't get on, every time you get on YouTube is a waste of time, or any time you get on social media is a waste of time. I'm not saying that. But I am saying you gotta be honest with yourself. If you are just aimlessly looking for something and you get off your phone and you find yourself still in wanting, kind of anxious, kind of needing something more, you just wasted time. Just keep it real with you. Surrender that to God. Ask God, God, am I, am I, is, this, is this really replenishing me? It's not just that. It's, it's many things. Good things can become bad when they're not used you know, properly. So I, I don't want to pick on electronics just... Evaluate your whole life. Take an order of your life. God, is there anything in life that I'm just, I'm just wasting? And then surrender that to him because the goal of us isn't just to live comfortably. It should be to live well for his glory and for the good of others. Amen? Amen. Amen. Reflect upon these things and see what God does. Let's pray. Lord, you created us with purpose, with purpose, to glorify you, really. And we will glorify you when we live well. When we work well and rest well, we will glorify you well. Would you please awaken us, awaken us to what it means to live well. Help us devote time to cultivation cultivating the garden you've placed us in, the relationships, the resources. May we cultivate them. Give us grace to care for the garden you've placed us in, to care for those relationships, to care for those resources, to care for the blessings that you have given us. Please let us work well, and please let us rest well to replenish our souls on a day-to-day -day basis and on a weekly basis to experience the beauty of rest and the reward of rest the blessing that rest is meant to be. Teach us to rest, God. And in those areas of our life that we're just wasting, please reveal it to us. Make us aware. Make us willing to, 
change it. Give us the courage to identify it and confess it and to move towards transformation. A life well lived is, is life and life abundantly. You, you lay that out before us. These things aren't, you have to do it. This is a, a blessing to take what's been preached and to apply it. So please give us the grace to do these things that we might glorify you and do good to our neighbor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said together. Amen. amen and amen. Let's all stand. In a moment, we're going to have a baptism. And a baptism is a picture of really living your life well. I'm going to surrender my life to Christ. I'm going to cultivate, care for, and rest in a relationship with God Almighty. What could be better than that? So let's sing a song as the baptismal is prepared, and then we will uh, perform this baptism. The strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now, Lord, now, indeed I Hit it all. really what baptism is all about. It's about having your sin washed away. This water, just to be clear, this water does not wash away sins, but this water is symbolic of what Christ did on the cross and what he achieved for us. Your sins are forgiven. They're washed away through faith in him. And this is an expression of that. As you go under the water, it's symbolic of you putting to death the old person filled with a sin, rebellious towards God. When you come out of that water, it's symbolic of you becoming a new creation, sin forgiven, washed clean, eternal life forever. Hallelujah. So that's what this is all about.
So at this moment, I want to invite up to the platform Ezra Coop. Grab the microphone there. All right, Ezra. Uh, go ahead and tell everybody your name. Let's try one more time to make sure the mic's working. Say it again. My name is Ezra. Very good. And Ezra, how old are you? I'm 11. 11. All right. Ezra, so help us understand, why do you want to be baptized today? I want to be baptized today because I want to be cleansed of my sin and to show that I want to be Christian for the rest of my life. Very good. And Ezra, what does it mean, or what does baptism mean or symbolize? Baptism symbolizes having your old body and then being put under the water and coming back out again and being in God's kingdom. Good. Excellent. And Ezra, how can someone have their sins forgiven? Someone can have their sins forgiven by trusting in Jesus Christ who died on the cross. Excellent. And, and what does it mean to persevere in the faith? What it means to persevere in the faith is keep believing in him, keep trusting. Amen. Come on into the water. And uh, Ezra's father can come on up as well. We'll do this together. Before we pray over him, anything you want to share with the congregation? Or share to your son with the microphone or anything? Um, I would just love to share a heartfelt thank you to this community. Uh, we just moved into this community less than two years ago, and uh, as you see over here, there's a band of <laughs> white over here, and uh, this morning we actually had an amazing opportunity. I invited some of these guys from KOZ, the leaders, um, one of Ezra's teachers from school, um, friends, those in home group and things, and we got to have some gentlemen come and bless Ezra this morning. Uh, we went on a hike, and they each got to just speak some wisdom into Ezra's life, and so... I just want to recognize that this is a community thing, and we're so grateful for this community, and we, we're thankful for all the words of encouragement that are going to pour into Ezra's life, and so before he shivers too much, um, if you have any words of encouragement for him that you would like to share, we'd also love written form out of that because we're hoping to make a book for him that just commemorates this day, so if you know him in some way, shape, or form, we'd love for uh, further encouragement, so thank you guys. We love you all. It is our privilege to baptize Ezra in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Plug your nose, buddy. Plug your nose.
Let's all sing together with one voice. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. And praise Him. children, you'll go ahead and uh, be dismissed back to the class. I want to encourage you, if you're someone who has never been baptized, someone who has never put their faith in Jesus, is not walking with Jesus, you can write a connect card, just put baptism, or just put uh, give my life to Christ. When myself or Pastor Matt, somebody will follow up with you, and we want to help you process that. We want to pray with you, find out what's going on in your heart, in your mind, uh, so that we can sort of shepherd you toward what God might be doing. If you need prayer for anything, in addition, even if it's, if you want to talk about that right now, our prayer team will be here. They would love to pray with you, encourage you, hear what's going on in your heart and in your mind. And I just want to encourage you, couldn't encourage you enough this week, really spend some time, 10 minutes in the morning. God, help me understand if I'm living well. Am I cultivating things? Am I caring for things? Am I resting well enough or am I just wasting and if you feel like something's off pray okay God I, I confess that help me fix that now that's what spiritual transformation is all about it's about bringing our things towards God confessing those things and then receiving his grace to change so reflect on those things talk about them in your home groups be really honest and let's be a people who live well amen amen all right God bless you see y'all next week <laughs>